What are those three colours? I want to say something more specific than blue. Ancient Greek did not have a word for the colour blue. The question for language is, is there a single root? Or did it evolve multiple times all over the world? Hello, I'm Hannah Fry. Dear Gwich, Emma is Annam Dum. Oh, what was that? That was Irish. Mmm, nice. <laughs> oh, in that case... Je m'appelle Adam Rutherford. Oh, OK. <laughs> How continental of you. I only know two phrases in Irish. Oh, go on. Uh, one of them is Inanna Manaha, August of Book. Yeah. Basically how to... Say your prayers, yourself. yeah. Bless yourself. And then the other one is Corwell Nabukli Kaholan. Where's the gorgeous fellas? Hey. Where's the ridey boys? Yeah, love that. Did you find those, <laughs> the ridey boys. Did you find, find that those two phrases get, like, get they, You get never say them in, in the same sentence. OK. <laughs> <laughs> never say them oh, in the same sentence. Oh, that's the great contradiction of Irishness, isn't it? Look, there's, there's two polarities. <laughs> <laughs> so today we're talking about do you speak human, about the origin of human languages and whether there's anything that we can say about it universally. This is a subject that you're particularly interested in, Emma? Yeah, it really is. Like, I have a very long standing, like, interest interest in language. Um, I think partially it stems from the fact that uh, I'm not English in any way in terms of my heritage, but I speak English as my first language, as do both of my parents, neither of whom are from here either. And yeah, I don't speak, uh, I don't speak Irish. I don't speak Yoruba, my father's language. That reality uh, caused me to think a lot and consequently end up studying quite a bit about language. Amazing. Yeah. I'm an evolutionary biologist and there's a very strong parallel between biological evolution and language evolution. There is one fundamental difference, which is that we and all living things and fossils are the living embodiment of the record of evolution. But there is no record of, of language evolution. Yeah. What do we know about it, though? Well, it's highly contested and, and no one <laughs> okay. really agrees. What do we contest about it? So whether language had a single origin. So we now think of humans as being biologically having a single origin in Africa. And when I say single origin, I actually mean the whole of Africa. So we now think of ourselves as a pan-African species. And, but that is where our species evolved. The question for language is, is there a single root to all of the thousands of languages that have been spoken over the last 100,000 years or so? Or did it evolve multiple times all over the world? But are there clues, though? I mean, are there, like, similarities? Or, or, or are there some languages that are just so far different from others that there's just no, there's no shared connection between them? It's more that we can't model it like a tree, right, with a single origin. It's more that, that, that because language, it operates, the evolution of language operates in two parallel ways. One is that it's passed from parents to children within cultures, but it's also passed between cultures. And so we adopt languages, we adopt words and we adopt uh, lexicon from all sorts of other, other cultures and other languages and other people that we are not biologically descended from. I fall into the camp of there isn't a single origin for language because humans were too diverse all over the world and there are too many languages for there to be a single origin, to be a plausible single origin. Um, and but but others still maintain that that there might have been a, a proto language which the the earliest humans spoke and all other languages are are derived in some way from that. There are some similarities though, right? Like mother, which obviously has a m sound in English, but in lots of languages has that sort of ma ma like that kind of same sound. Nose as well, right? Has similarities in lots of languages. Yeah, there was a study a few years ago which which picked out a few dozen words and it appeared that there were similarities in the sounds for words across languages which appeared to have very distant or possibly no evolutionary connection. And they all tended to be words that were very clearly associated with sort of bodies and universal features that, that, that humans experience. So words like nose and some colours and some weather patterns, and they, they appeared to have similar sounds at a level that was statistically higher than if it was just chance. And that probably indicates not shared origins, evolutionary origins of those words, but that we verbalise, we vocalise particular sounds in particular ways and everyone has a nose. So the word for nose turned out to be quite similar in all languages spoken by people with noses. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe it's just because I've been brought up on the word, but like there's something quite nasal about the word nose. Quite you know possibly, I mean? yeah. And then there's also languages that like don't, like it's been, there's been research done into it to see if they do have some sort of like shared like origin or overlap and they don't, but they have 
like a lot of words that are similar, like for instance, Japanese and Yoruba, my dad's language, has a lot of similar words, a lot of similar names like Fumi, Remy. Um, but yeah, it's just it's just coincidental. And there, there are um, uh, onomatopoeic words as well, which work, work universally as well, that we often create words. You remember that all words are made up, mm. right? But it appears that some are made up more closely associated with the thing that they're trying to describe. So, you know, a buzzy bee. It buzzes in every single language, mm. uh, no matter where it's where it's from. But so don't, don't the words for animal, the, the sounds that animals make, they're different in different languages, they, right? They, they just, certainly are. Yeah. And, and we even to, even to the extent that we now know that certain animals have different regional accents as well, depending on where they've been raised. Did you see that viral <laughs> clip of the Scouse baby? Who oh, had like a really baby. strong Scouse accent, but it had no words. Absolutely. So it sounds were just Scouse. It was yeah, wonderful. It was amazing. <laughs> it was absolutely amazing. But okay, in terms of like the evolution of languages then, languages merging and, and kind of growing into new ones, there are also languages that are lost over time, right? There are lots. And um, actually like at SOAS where I studied and taught, there was like a, a center for endangered languages. Um, I think a language like Irish isn't necessarily like endangered, but the amount of people that speak it is um, is, is is really small. Um, it's actually going through something of a renaissance at the moment. And it's kind of become like quite hip to study Irish in a way that it certainly wasn't when I was when I was in school. I haven't seen the film yet, but there's the the Irish language film that's just been nominated for the Oscar. Uh, the band kneecap and apparently that's like Irish being spoken in a very like anarchic kind of like chaotic way and so the way we speak English even is is sometimes like as as though we're speaking Irish but let me try and think of an example uh I've just done this I've just done something It'd be like I'm after doing something yeah so things like that but if I kind of spoke like that like when I was growing up I'd be kind of corrected like to like to speak to speak properly, but then speaking properly is just trying to speak like, I guess, a more anglicised like form of, of English rather than like Hiberno-Irish, Hiberno-English rather. It is such a way to speak properly. And I think it's one of those things which is a, it, you know, particularly in the UK that we have this sense that there is the correct way to speak, how the king might speak or how people who present on Radio 4 might speak continuously. But of course, all, the, the key thing about language is that it continuously evolves. And the UK is one of the countries on earth that has one of the densest concentrations of regional dialects to the extent that it, when it was being measured in the 20th century, it's like a few miles mm -hmm. between distinct measurable dialects. So I'm from Suffolk and, and I can say words to you that you presumably have no idea what they mean. If I said that picture is on the her, would you have any clue what I, what, what I meant? What does it mean? On a hook? No, it's slightly like a skew. Ah, it's on the her. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's one thing when you look at the evolution of languages borrowing from each other and, and words being you know, created and lost. But I think there's something really intriguing that appears when you start to look at languages from a much more macro perspective, when you kind of look at them all simultaneously. So, OK, I'm going to show you um, something. I'm going to show you three colours, all right? And I want you to tell me, what are those three colours? Blue, purple and brown. Yeah, lots of different languages would agree with you. But if you spoke ancient Greek, they did not have a word for the colour blue. Instead, their main focus on colour was on light and dark. Mm. So actually, if you analyse the number of basic colour words that different languages have, it turns out that there is a very particular hierarchy in which the words appear. So if a language only has two colour words, then it's always light and dark. If there's three colour words, it's light, dark and red. And then the next colour to appear is either yellow or green. This works for 83% of languages, by the way. Uh, followed by blue, followed by brown. I think the thing that's most intriguing is the order in which we prioritise naming colours, which appears to be consistent across languages across the world. That red is more dominant in our minds. It's more of a priority for us to name it than, than blue, for instance. Mm. I, which I suppose you could theorise is to do with red being a very striking sign Absolutely. Of, of warning from Absolutely. blood or and the, and richness the, of fruit or something yeah. like that. Yeah, and the, until you had, you know, um, like uh, dying processes and, and sort of, um, I don't know, artificial colours, the only thing that was blue really is the sky, you know, mm. and maybe the sea. And they're not always blue either. Exactly. They're very changeable. 
Um, I think there's something really neat, though, about the idea that there's, there's something about the way that humans experience the world that ends up finding its way in to the words that we choose to prioritise and the language that we choose to make. Mm -hmm. The other thing that's, that's, I think, really intriguing is that it looks as though it's not just that the way we perceive things changes our language, but the way that we speak about things changes our perception. So Greek speakers, for instance, who have two words for blue, when Greek speakers move to an English-speaking country, they get less good at distinguishing between blues over time. <laughs> mm, that's fascinating. How about in Irish? Yeah, there's actually like been a really interesting debate around blue and its use in relation to race. Um, so like traditionally, like in the Irish language, you wouldn't describe somebody as black. You would describe them as blue. So the phrase would be dinner, uh, dinner, dinner girl. It's like the blue men. Um, and then Ireland's never really had like a black population. So nobody was really talking about this. And then since the kind of migration that's happened in Ireland, um, you know, from the kind of like mid 90s onwards, there's now like a generation of kind of like black Irish people. And some of uh, those are Irish speakers. And there was a debate being like, oh, we don't want to be called blue people. We want to be called black people. But I actually thought that and also the blue that's being used is um, so the Gurham, the blue, it's not like the primary color blue. But apparently I've had it explained to me that it's more like the way the quality of like when light reflects on a dark surface, mm. the iridescence mm. that is created when that happens. So it's quite like a poetic mm. kind of rendering as opposed to just being the primary color blue. And there's very ancient references to Dinagurum that, de that predate the invention of the racial categories, black and white. So my position was, if we have a way for describing people who are racialized as black, that predates the kind of like violent hierarchy taxonomy of race, I think that has really exciting decolonial possibilities. I think that's so interesting. Like language really matters. It really does, and the example that Emma's talking about is the foundation of how we talk about race today. Those colours that, that Emma's referring to are exactly how the foundations of the racialization of people occurred back in the 16th, 17th century, and it was those four colours, black, white, but also yellow for East Asian people and red skins for people, Na Native Americans. And those terms, although a couple of them are now considered to be racist and have generally fall out, fallen out of um, common usage, but black and white are still the way we describe literally billions of people. And it doesn't take a genius to see that neither of those colours accurately reflect the pigmentation of the people who bear those mm -hmm. skin tones or the diversity of the skin tones themselves. Yeah, they're ideological constructs rather than something reflecting... Like the reality. Truly, yeah. Yeah, right. absolutely. I think, I mean, much of language is that, right? Like it, it, all of language, I think you could argue to a certain extent, is uh, has meaning only because of the way words relate to other words. There is something also that's really, really interesting that happens when you create a map of all of those relationships between different words. So this is essentially what artificial intelligence has been doing because you can create essentially a galaxy of stars of all of the words in a particular language and mark out a map of how each word relates to each other. If you do that for like, say, the top 10,000 words in each language, it kind of creates this particular structure and it turns out that that structure is found consistently again and again and again in languages from all across the world. So not just English and Spanish, which, you know, are like quite similar, but if you rotate these atlases, you can map one onto the other from like, you know, Swahili to Urdu or like Japanese to Swedish. And I think, again, it's another example of how the way that we see the world as humans ends up finding itself in our language. Let me show you this. So this is this is my phone. This is the Galaxy Z Flip 6. And because it's got Galaxy AI on it, there is this very cool feature called Interpreter, which allows you to have bilingual conversations. Okay, you ready? I'm going to pretend to be German for the purposes of this conversation. Jawohl. Wo ist mein Handy? Where's my phone? Oh, very good. It's good, isn't it? Why does it live? 
That's very good. Go on, respond to me. Your phone is in your hand, Professor Fry. Your telephone is in your hand, Professor Fry. Danke. Nice. Uh -huh. <laughs> cool, huh? Yeah, it's really impressive. I remember living in Japan before um, this kind of translation tool was like widely available and it was just like, if I couldn't speak Japanese, I could not be understood. So you just couldn't have the most like kind of basic exchanges. So if you had something like that, it would just be an entirely different experience. Okay, so here's the thing I think about languages in general. Maybe they didn't all come from a single origin. Maybe they have been used a lot to divide us, but maybe with AI, they might end up at a similar destination.